Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, you may be Amen. I was going to say this is uh, Chris and the Three Amigos. That was, I guess, not too funny, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, that didn't go over well. Sometimes they, 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 they get flat. Hey, can you bring me down just a little bit? I'm really hot in this, so I, and I'm playing on screaming a lot. Um, you know, one of the things that I believe that is true is we never ever really take advantage 100% of what God has for us as His children. Um, we never take, what I mean by that is I don't think we ever fully take advantage of the, the resources that are found in the abundancy of God. Um, somebody once said it like this, he, you know, uh, if God gave, gave us basically atomic bomb power, but we live firecracker lives. And I really believe that's true. I, you know, I, as, as I look at the way I've been, even my own self, I mean, I'll have to be, I mean, I'm going to throw myself under the bus the, the majority of this in the, in, in the rules of expectancy and the law of expectancy, a lot of times I just I just have low expectations and, and God's really been challenging me on living more of a, a in, in, in the life of faith and just trusting Him and taking and just, just being in, in one with Him and, and just letting Him just use me and guide me and not worrying about well, it, you know, not worrying about, about things so much. And, uh, and, and I, I, there's a passage of scripture I want to share with you right off the bat. It's Ephesians 3.30. And you can turn there in your Bibles. So hopefully you have this new uh, crazy awesome outline. If you raise your hands, they'll bring you one. But uh, you, it's all the sermon notes and everything are right there on the back. But uh, listen to this. It's in the, this just comes from the Amplified Version. And I want to read this to you. It says, God is able to do super abundantly. I love that. Super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare ask or think. If you look at it this way, what we ask for, God is able to even do super abundantly above that. Infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, and dreams. What God can do in our lives in what we ask God to do in our lives, it seems to be two different levels. We have a tendency not to just, to not just, I, I really actually am reading this book, and I challenge you again this week, I challenged you last week to get The Circle Maker by Mark Batterson. And Mark Batterson in The Circle Maker talks about how we insult God many a times with our prayers. We insult God with our request. We insult Him in such a way that, that you know, we, we, don't, we don't think outside of our own little small world that we live in. And we, we, we have a tendency to never, ever, ever tap into the tremendous resources that is available to us through our Heavenly Father, our relationship. There's a term that's going around. I, I love this, and I'm starting to see this a lot in, in young girls. There, the faith says this. She'll, she'll say this a lot. She'll go, "I'm a princess." And and, and and what she needs is she goes, "I'm a princess in in a kingdom, in God's kingdom." And I really believe that she she has a mentality that and I, everything. I, I love the childlike faith that she has that God can provide anything and everything because she is His princess. Now, Matthew chapter nine, verse twenty-nine, Jesus un gives us the key that unlocks this great power that, 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 that is possessed by Almighty God, and that is this. This is what He says in verse twenty-nine of Matthew nine. He says, "According to your faith, it will be done to you." You know, this is what the what the Bible calls basically the law of expectations. It, it's, it's you know. It, it, it goes all the way through the scripture. You choose how much God blesses your life. You choose it. The law of basically, basically the law of expectation says basically we get what we expect out of life. I mean, if you go around and you have a tendency, you know, we tend to expect what we see. 
And we, we expect what we, what we tend to feel. And we expect what we, you know, th th we tend to act the way we expect to act. These expectations are what drives us in these expectations we have. I guarantee you tomorrow morning, if you wake up and you go, man, I'm feeling sick. By the end of the day, you're sick. Or, I, or this is going to be a terrible day. Well, it probably will. Eventually, we tend to achieve what we expect to achieve. Our life is written, kind of guided by this law of expectations. Your expectations influence your life far more than you realize. Your expectations influence your happiness. Your influence, they influence your health. Your expectations influence your relationships. Now, I believe there's two basic approaches to life. There's a life of fear. This is, there's an approach that everything in your life is driven by fear. You're afraid of this or you're afraid of that. And then there's a, a life that I believe is lived, lived in faith. Man, I've been living in back and forth between the two of these and the swing of this. And I, you know, I just got to, in, in a Christian life, there were some areas in my life that I just thought, man, I really got this wire. And then God began to just start to rub, jerk the rugs out from under my feet. I mean, when we, we were rolling right along with the tent, and then all of a sudden, the tent's gone. We were rolling right along in some areas, and the next thing you know, God just jumbles that up. And see, this is the thing is, is I believe we can approach these two in either one two ways. In, in fear, that's more of a, a pessimistic view of life, or we can view it in an optimistic view of life and, and, and be more in faith. Now, here's a good example, a biblical example of somebody. Now, I'm not saying that Job was always a pessimist, but in this case, Job was definitely a pessimist. In Job chapter 3, verse 24, he says, Everything I fear and dread comes true. Everything I fear and dread comes true. You know anybody like that? Man, just follow Facebook for five minutes. <laughs> Man, I, don't, I try not to read Facebook the first five minutes because I'm like, I don't want to be that impressed. It's just like it's over and over. Everything I fear and dread, everything, the focus that I have, that when, you know, I focus on what, what I don't want and, and, I, and, I, and, and, and you become this victim of a self-fulfilled prophecy. You say, well, I can't do that. Guess what? You, guess what? You can't. You can't do that. I've had bread in my face before, and I said, I can't lift it anymore. And he goes, Dad, just killed it right there. <laughs> Haven't you? Numerous times. As soon as I said, I can't lift it anymore, he goes, you just did it. You killed it. You could have until you said you could. Then there's a second type of mindset, and this is Paul. And I, most of Paul's writings, you see the same mindset over and over and over. Look at Philippians 1.20. I live in eager expectation while what? I'm going through all these trials. He says, I live in eager expectation while I'm getting ready for my retirement. No. While I'm planning this vacation. Absolutely not. While I'm at Disney, I live in eager expectation that the mouse is going to bless me. No. While I'm going through trials. Man, this verse challenged me this week. And it's like, how, how in the world is it only in faith, only in this strong faith of the Christ Jesus plan and, his, in, in, and that, that he's always in control. He's always in power. It's this mindset. Paul says, I don't care if you're living in, in a prison cell with the hope of not making it out of their life. He still lives in eager expectation. He could be cheerful even when he couldn't be happy. God, you might write that down. Paul was able to be cheerful even when he wasn't able to be happy. Now, what are you expecting the God to do in your life? And this is, what I'm, this is going to be the question, basically, you'll see it. It's at the bottom, but I'm going to go ahead and start it right now. What are you expecting God to do in the next seven days? What are you expecting Him to do? I can tell you what I'm expecting. I'll let the cat out of that. I'm expecting God to finish the funding of our trip to Haiti in the next seven days. 
Not just mine. Everyone's. Mary, what's off the top of your head? What do you think the total of that would be? Is that 10000 5000 $7,000 to get our trip to Haiti fully funded. I believe God in the next seven days is going to provide every single dime of that. Not just mine. I'm talking about everybody's. I believe it. Oh, that was just mine? <laughs> What's everybody's? $15,000 in the next seven days. I am expecting God. Man, you know how to double it, don't you? What can I say? Alright, we're done. Let's go home. <laughs> yeah, it's time to quit. Um, I expect, what do you expect God to do in the next seven days? This is a message. I, 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 we, chose this, we chose this message series with, with, with plan and purpose. Listen, our church is growing. We're getting, we're getting more. I mean, I know it doesn't look like it this morning because everybody's on. I love the vacation people that come on. When, I, when the vacation weekends, if you're here on Sunday, you're my favorite people in the whole wide world. I know it's just because you're broke and you can't go anywhere, but you're still my favorite people in the whole wide world. Because you're on church on a vacation weekend. Yes! But other people that have, need, that have money, that are gone, they need to repent. <laughs> but for the rest of us, we're here. We're here. And, and, but this is the thing is, I really believe, what are you expecting God to do? And I think there's three things that, that come out of ex expectation. When you expect God to do something, you're honoring. First thing I believe, when you expect God to do something, you're honoring Him. I'm trusting Him. Did you know that the, the children of Israel were condemned over and over and over in the Old Testament for not expecting God to deliver them, not expecting God to provide for them, not expecting God to do anything for them? The entire time they were there, they were looking to other gods. What other God are you looking to to meet your needs and not expecting God? You're not honoring God. You, you honor God by saying, I am trusting Him. It's like, uh, it's like, my mom said this, and she goes, when you're an orphan, and that's what happens to all of us eventually, hopefully if we live that long, and we live to see our parents pass away. You always had this expectation that my daddy can do anything. My mommy can do anything. But there's a point in life where you become that person. You know what I'm saying? And this is who you turn to. It, there's, when you say, I expect God to do anything, you're basically saying, my dad, my mom can do, my daddy can do anything. I'm not putting mom and God. My daddy can do anything. Don't misread that. I love what William Carey said. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. It brings them on. Get your head out there. Stick your neck out. Go crazy. It also, number two, it also increases your ability. Do you know athletes know that the winning edge is already winning the game? If you ever interview, you see them interview a professional athlete, you'll never see one going, wow, what if you're lucky to get out of here with a, with a win? Well, this really be lucky. They would be fired in a second. Man, you know, I just hope, I just hope we have a team left to play the next day after this game. Did you know that that uh, Muhammad Ali only lost two bouts? And do you know what? Or the, the the common denominator between those two bouts were? Huh? Self -doubt. In his interviews, he said, "If I win this fight," that's all he said. In the two interviews preceding those two losses, Muhammad Ali said. If I win this fight. Let me tell you something, guys. You guys, you guys you've got to have an expectancy. Did you know uh, David, one of the greatest of all time, and this is, it, it, he went after Goliath with a smooth stone, but you know what it took? He took five of them. You know why he took five long? He said, well, he didn't, maybe he missed the first one. No. You find out later on in 2 Samuel 21, Goliath had four other brothers. See, David went after Goliath with five smooth stones, not thinking, hey, 
I may, may need another stone somewhere along the way to take down the life. No, I'm going after all five of them. You see, well, you know, in, 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 in that time, see, they, they thought that everybody was thinking at this time, hey, he's too big to hit. And David's saying, he's too big to miss. See, there's a difference in person. He's, he's, it's increasing your ability. Now, the third thing that I believe that expectation brings is also encourages the others. It's already encouraging the others. Just think if you woke up on Facebook every morning and go, man, I'm going to attack this world and I'm going to tear it down and single-handedly I'm going to, you know, God's going to use me this morning to do great things. Somebody reads that and they're like, wow. See, optimism is encouraging. It's contagious. You know, you know when you when you are when you're thinking in a way that 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 I mean is going is is this godly faith like way. I'm trusting the Lord; He's going to take care of it. I, I'm I'm going for it. You know, Miss Jen, I, and I know we need to be praying for her. Uh, she is going through rehab right now. She has had what they believe is a stroke. Am I right on that, George? And 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 you know what? I've never even in the, in the darkest days of this woman's life. You still see somebody who will talk. When you go talk to her, I'm telling you, she's going to go, I'm trusting the Lord. I'm wonderful. God's going to do it. He's going to deliver me. That right there, man, will challenge you and make you want to be a better person. You'll get up there and you go, man, why is that old woman show me up every time? <laughs> she's got that faith. You know, when I walk off this platform and she sits over there every single Sunday, she grabs me and says, that was a wonderful message. She always encourages me. Even before, if I see her before the service, man, I'm looking so forward to what God's going to share with, with us through you this morning. Man, how can you, how can you not preach after that? But you may be saying, man, I kind of have a tendency to be more of a, a pessimist or more negative. Let me give you some statistics. George Gallup found out this. Here's some striking evidence of faith for you. You might write this, some of this down. There are empirical evidence and findings that, that, that genuinely devout people were the happiest people and also the most healthy. Genuinely devout people. I talk about who look to their relationship with God as a primary, their primary thing in life. It also found that they, the people who had deep faith are, are this is this, ethical in their personal dealings. It also found that they're more tolerant of people with different backgrounds. It also found that they're more apt to perform charitable acts and more concerned about the betterment of society and far more happier than anyone else. This is all from George Gallup. People of faith, he said, we found that, you know, when they, when you, that the stigma, it's a stigma that, that the more religious people are, the more close-minded they are, and the more bigoted, bigoted that they are. He, George Gallup said, we found just the opposite to be true. That the more devout someone is, the more understanding, the more they, the more encouraging they are, and the more open to people that they are. And faith brings optimism, guys. Now I'm going to give you some. Here's how some. some here, this is what I want. To, I want to equip you with this. How to stay optimistic, or how to stay encouraged, how to stay, uh, you know, up in, in faith and trusting in discouraging times. Because I'm going to tell you something. Faith is like a muscle. You have to work it. If you lay around all day, you're going to look like this. If you exercise, you're going to look like Brad. What I'm calling you to do is to exercise your faith. I want you to have strong faith. And the way you do that is you've got to get yourself out there and you've got to do some spiritual calisthenics. Here's some six exercises that I believe are going to help you to stay encouraged during discouraging times. Because I'm going to tell you right now, we look at things and we go, all right, we've got this many, um, uh, we call those scandals in the, in, in the government. And we've got a tornado hitting more Oklahoma. And I'm going to tell you, man, I've been through a tornado with those Okies. Watch an interview with an Okie who just lost his house in the tornado. They're like, man, I'm just proud of where in. Thank God the dog was saved, mom was saved, everybody was saved. We got in a Brady hole and we were fine. I saw a video of a guy came out of the storm cellar and his whole house was gone. He came out of the storm cellar and he goes, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. That was the first words out of his mouth. And this old, old guy, you know, above him there, he goes, you know, the good Lord just takes care of us. You know, and I'm just like, and you know, there's some people that, that lost family. 
And they're deep, deep. I, I've been with people who've lost family in tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff like that. And I'm telling you, man, those people of faith, they are stronger. They are, they're, they're, their eyes are more on, fixed on Jesus. Their hope is in eternal. So how do you stay optimistic when everything looks like it's going wrong? Now, here, this is, here's some things I want you to do. Um, how many of you would at first admit, how many of you admit you're grouchy in the mornings? I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I really, morning is my day, my time. I'm puffed in the mornings because I got a new day. It's usually, I'm like 8.30 grouch at night, like 9, 10 o'clock. I'm like, okay, it's time to shut this thing down. Um, I've been up eating too much on, on the day I get me. Or something. Uh, the life is beating me down that day. I don't know. But but here's the deal. I want you to, some of you some of you say, man, I wake up grouchy in the morning. And many of you, you know, and, and, and this, is, this, this is what I want you to look at. Um, I want you to look at it this way. Start your morning with something different than what you already are. Here's the scripture. I want you to look at the scripture. Psalm 3, 5, or 5, 3. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. Voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you, and I wait in expectation. Listen to this. He goes, I wait in expectation in the morning. For those of you that, are, that start off a little sluggish and in a bad mood, the first thing I want to challenge you, don't read the news. Amen. Stay away from the news. Don't turn on Fox News. Don't go to foxnews.com. Don't, you know, don't go to CNN.com. Don't go to MSNBC. Uh, don't go. Don't turn on Bad Morning America. I mean, you, you've got to. You've got to just go eat your Cheerios, grab the Word of God, and start your morning focused on the Scripture, focused on the Word of God. So the first thing that you do is you start your day in faith. Start your day in faith. I love this scripture. We used to say this all the time in the, in the church that I used to go to. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Man, here's, a, here's an exercise for you. Why don't you just wake up tomorrow morning and just, you know, as soon as your eyes hit and open up, you just go, this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then when your wife, you know, hits you at the head or whatever, just keep, just keep smiling. But I mean, just jump up in the morning and first thing is you just go, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> you know, when you start your morning in joy and in, in optimism, did you know that that releases endorphins in your mind, and it already directs the day that you are getting ready to live, it already sets you in the right direction. When you verbally speak up, you know what I'm saying? Instead of saying, good morning, Lord. I mean, you know, instead of saying, good Lord, it's morning. Say, good morning, Lord. You know, you, you have a different mentality. Say, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad. That's a scripture you can memorize. That's Psalm 118, 24. Number two. Here's one that's really, God's really challenged me on. I'm going to hang here for just a second. Look for good in your situation. Look for the good in your situation. Romans 8, 28. I love this scripture. I want you, I'm going to read this to you. For those who love God, who are called according to His plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. And those who love God and are according, called according to His plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. Does that mean that everything that happens is good? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But I want you to circle pattern for good. See, God specializes in bringing good out of that. <coughs> In order for God to do that, though, guys, what do you have to start with? Well, I know, but to get good out of bad, what do you start with? Bad. you got to think about this thing. you got to break this down a second. In order for God to get glory and, to, and for your faith to be strengthened and for this to actually work in the way that the Scripture counted, you got to start with bad. We like the... We hate the, say it again, we love them, 
And we hate the bad. Exactly. See, here's the problem. We get the bad and we go, all right, I'm done. Sing church. Not going back there again. I don't like these people. I want to get rid of my family. Does that sound familiar? I mean, everybody's getting real quiet. <laughs> See, here's what happens is we don't, we don't go, God, this is really bad. And I don't know what you're going to do to bring out good, but I know that you are going to bring out good. And let me tell you something I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about Pollyanna. I'm not talking about pop psychology, self-help, psych yourself up, phony pep talk, garbage. I'm just not. In fact, that kind of stuff gives faith a bad name. I'm not talking about grin, TV evangelist, you know, just that, that, that phony garbage that just makes me want to throw up. What I'm talking about is I'm talking about affirming the truth. Look for the good in the situation and be realistic and optimistic at the same time. See, that's one of the things I love about my mom. She's realistic and op op you know, op optimistic at the same time. She'll say, you're overweight. But you're still an attractive man. <laughs> she takes the good or the bad and, should, and also can bring out the good of it. You know what I'm saying? Tom Sedison tells a story about Tom Sedison. One of his, one of his uh, laboratories was burned down and, and, in New Jersey. When it burned down, it cost him several millions of dollars in equipment. And he also lost all of the records. He didn't have it backed up on, you know, on a hard drive somewhere on a cloud, guys. This was in a filing cabinet, in the paper. It burned down with the factory. Yet he had all the records of most of his life work. The next morning, he walked out among the ashes, and he said, there is great value in disaster. And he said this, all our mistakes are burned up. <laughs> Thank God we can start anew. He turned that stumbling block into a stepping stone for the good of the situation. See, guys, it's not pop psychology. It's just saying, all right, listen, we lost all the, the good things, but we lost all the bad things, too, and he chose to face, uh, before, you know, to focus on the bad things. Here, I want, you to start, I want you to write this down. If you, don't, if you don't leave with anything else, I want you to leave this this is something that really inspired me, and I heard this, and it really inspired me, and this is the way I'm trying to model my life out of this. Things turn out best for people who make the best out of the way things turn out. You mean to repeat that? Things turn out best for people who make the best of the way things turn out. See, you're going to have to look at the way things turn out, and you're going to have to make the best of it. You can't bring yourself down and others down and the situation down. You're going to have to guess, and guess whose choice it is to decide to do that? Yours. Not mine. Not the government's. Yours. You've got to make the best of it. You have to. Number three, give your problems to God. When worry comes, when you assume responsibility that God never intended you to have. You know what work I, I don't have this personally in my Jeep, so I just drive around pretty much in a stupor, not knowing what's going on. Because I have no instruments in my Jeep at all. I just drive around in a, in a, in a total bliss of, well, it's over here. I'll know soon enough when the steam starts coming out or whatever. No, no pressure? I'm not sure. Just drive around. But listen, those dashes, those indicators on your on your dash that your your car has because it works. If the oil light comes on, what is that telling you? Put some oil in it. If the if the little thermometer light comes on, what does that tell you? It's overheating. 
let's throw some water in it. Here's the deal. You have a warning light. We in the, in the industry, we call those idiot lights. Nice. Yes. <laughs> idiot lights. I used to, we got a pilot and an aircraft maintenance guy in, this, in the room at the same time. Here's my funny, all right, here, here I'm going to start a little more. <laughs> we used to get these work requests from pilots and they would say, well this piece of equipment doesn't work and we need to get it fixed. And I'm like, okay, so I take it and we go down there and we power it up and it worked fine. And it worked, everything worked great, everything worked fine. And so what I would write, and they, they, they stopped this because they didn't want to see this anymore. And they are in charge because there's the pilots and they're in charge of it. I, I would write, O N switch does not work in O F F position. <laughs> that boy, they used to get all mad. So they, because they review all those. What, how, what do they do to fix that? We flew this bird a couple of weeks ago, and they're like, oh, the switch doesn't work. Oh, I want to talk to that guy. <laughs> those lights are there to warn you that something is. <coughs> in your life. Your car's going to When you start to worry, that's a big old warning light on the dash of your life saying, guess what? I've taken the control out of God's hands and I've placed them in the line. I'm holding up the universe now. No need for God. You see? That's what worry does. Worry says, I'm in charge. I'm in control. I've got it all right here. And it doesn't work. You get stressed out. You start to get all uncomfortable. You start to get sick in your stomach. Trust me, I've been here. This right here is not where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be on this God holding it up. That's who's in charge of my universe. I've got to give God my cross. I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. Look at this. We were crushed and overwhelmed and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But that was good. <laughs> what? Oh, let me read that again. No, that was bad. No, that was good. For then, he says, we put everything into the hands of God. Man, this, is, this really hit personal with me. My mom, I don't know what's going on with my mom, but she's lost like the use of her left side, her leg, her arm, kind of even in, in, in her. In her. She just, she's, she's just got this almost like a paralysis. And so the doctor, she's going to the doctors, and we were talking on the phone. And she was telling me about it. We were talking. And she goes, I just had everything kind of mapped out. We were in our retirement years and all that. And I told her, I said, Mom, I said, the way I read this book and the way that I understand God, there's never going to be a time in your life when you're not facing some form of trouble. And it's just what Paul said here. That was good. For then, we put everything into the hands of God. For He can even raise the dead. What? He can even raise the dead. And He did help us. And we expect Him to do it what? Again and again. When you got life wired, you don't need God. You make this young couple and you're sitting there going, man, I don't even know how we're going to pay the electric bill. I don't even know how we're going to pay the mortgage. I just don't know what, you, guess what, that's good. This church has basically lived on that for 12 years. I don't know, well, it's good. We'll trust God. How are we going to go to Haiti? Somebody, I had a couple this weekend, sat in my office and they go, when we heard how many people were going to Haiti and the size of this church, our jaw hit the floor. We couldn't believe it. I'm like, we're SEAL team. <laughs> this church didn't expect to have to have 200 people to go to Haiti. We're sending, you realize we're almost sending 20 people to Haiti, and that's, about, that's, that's like one third of our church. <laughs> if the mega churches were sending one third of their people on missions, there would be thousands and thousands of plane tickets going out in America all the time. One third. Last year, 
here we sit one half. I thought we were a little down. <laughs> but we expect him to do it again and again. And then guess what? When you're that, you're, I told I, I told my mom. I said I remember eating a lot of beans because you guys just didn't have the resources to make it through the month. And she goes, Oh, I know, we were struggling. And I said, You don't have to do that much anymore, do you? And she goes, No, we, we're pretty, you know, but that's that part of our lives. Is, I said, Yeah. Now you got a new trouble physically. And then there's another one out there that some people are in, and that's relational. Maybe you have that child that's wayward, and you go, well, we're, we're fine physically. We're doing great financially, but man, this child is just killing us. Good. <laughs> that's God delivering you again and again. What we do in Christianity, we get somebody, I don't know where they got this pipe in somewhere, but they thought, man, I've become a Christian. All my troubles are gone. I'm living, I just go, name it, claim it. It's a bunch of fooey. When it's out of your control, it's good. It's in God's control. Number four, you need to eliminate negative words. Have you ever talked to yourself into feeling bad? Yeah. Yo, I'm so tired. Man, I ain't got tired. Let's, let's just go ahead and end this here and go home. Because I'm tired. You can talk yourself into anything, guys. You can talk yourself into being sick. You can use negative words. You can complain. And you can, it'll become almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can talk yourself, and I've literally done this, into depression. One night I was just laying there and I was... And Charity knows, uh, Charity, know, Charity knows now not the same thing, but she used to not know any better. I do. <sighs> Charity's like laying there and she goes, <sighs> and call it, she was just either charitable or just being stupid. But she goes, what's wrong? I just go, well, I just want somebody to feel sorry for me. She goes, feel sorry for you. And I go, yeah, I just want to wait for the start. And she goes, listen. You pulled me out of living about an hour from my family because you felt God calling us down here to start a church. And we're here and we're doing that and you're getting to do exactly what you asked God for. But it's not working out the way you thought it should work out. And I said, yeah. And she goes, you want me to feel sorry for you? You're doing everything you wanted to do. Man, I tell you what, I, I'm learning now just, just go on to sleep. Don't go. <sighs> <laughs> Eliminate those negative words, folks. It's like the hyper hypochondriac that they wrote on that tombstone. I told you I was sick. <laughs> you know? I told you I was sick. Look at Ephesians 4 29. Don't use harmful words in talking, use only healthy words, the kind that build up. Circle that word only. Use only helpful words. Did you know the Bible is major theme in the Bible all the way through the New Testament? It, it is this. I could have used hundreds of verses in this in this in, the, in illustrating this. If the major theme is positive. Let me give you an illustration. The Savior is born and he dies. But he's raised again. A group of individuals follow him, and they're idiots. But they start a movement that's 2,000 years later still going. There's your thing. You got a group of people who are always going to be persecuted, and they're going to always be hurt. But guess what? They're going to inherit eternal life forever. Think about that for a second. A Savior who's born, who's, born, who's going to save the world, he dies on the cross and raises again. A group of idiots follow him and become the leaders of a, of a movement that's never going to die. Can't stop it. 
No king's going to shut it down. No president's going to get rid of it. Burn the Bible. I don't care. Do all you want. You can't stop the movement of Christianity. It's, un it's impossible. Like I told you before, I'm not talking about phony pep talk. I'm not talking about, you know, the, the, what, you, you heard that what the mind can conceive, you can achieve. That's a bunch of the mind. <laughs> I, I, okay, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna be a wide receiver. That for the for uh, I'll tell you, I'll pick a good team. <laughs> I was gonna say Miami Dolphins, but I don't want to be a Miami team. They don't have a good quarterback. I want to be a I'm gonna be a wide receiver for the Patriots. And I'm gonna receive bombs from from the arms of the Golden Boy himself, Tom Brady. I'm gonna concede that. Uh, it's not happening. What the mind can conceive does not mean you can always achieve, people. All right, I'm just saying, there's certain things you can't do. That's fine. Do what God made you to do. See, it always goes back to the Creator. It always goes back to the found in itself in God. I love what Joel says, though, in, in his, in his uh, book. Minor prophet Joel says, Let the weak say, I am I love what James says in James 3, 5. The tongue is a small thing, what, but what enormous damage it can do. Learn from me. I know that there are things in my wife's heart that will never, ever, ever go away. That came out of this now. That hurt I've asked for forgiveness a million times, but it still doesn't take away from the enormous damage that is done in her heart. You can set people up for success, or you can set people up for failure. It's your choice with your mouth. You want to guarantee somebody will change? Lay them. Well, he never does this. He never does that. She never does this. She never does that. I always have to deal with this. He'll never, ever, ever do it. Okay? You just guarantee it. He's not going to change. It's like putting a rubber stamp right on. Boom. Never going to be the same. I'm hurry, guys. Number five, associate with positive people. First Corinthians 15, 13, 15, 33 says, bad companions ruin good character. Psalm 1, blessed the man who walks in, not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. That's what he's saying. So don't surround yourself with these people. Get outside them. I'm going to give you two, two initials, the VIPs and the VDPs. VIPs are very inspiring people. Hang out with them. And you got the VDPs. They're very draining people. Kind of limit your amount of intake of very draining people. Because I'm going to tell you something. They will drain you. If you ever go to one of the, I've seen this before. There's these therapy groups that everybody's like just a downer. That's why sometimes those don't work. You know? Everybody's convincing the other one how terrible their life is. We're not going anywhere, people. Let's, let's start getting some, some VIP, very inspiring people in your life. Number six, remember your future, guys. How can you read the end of the Bible and not be optimistic? I'm trying to hurry. There was, a, yeah, there was a missionary, though. This is a true story. There was a, there was a missionary who came home during right at the end. Uh, he had been in Africa, and the World War II had been going on in uh, Europe and in Japan. And uh, it was over, and there was a victory. And, and uh, he actually arrived at the airport at the very same time that Eisenhower got off the plane. 
and there's all this victory. We love Ike. Welcome home, Ike. It was a ticker tape parade. It was it was crazy. And this this missionary had spent his entire life in Africa serving the Lord. He lost his wife, his children had all died of malaria. He was dying. He was broken, in poor health, and he was come off the plane, and there was not even a soul there to greet him. And he saw the banners and the crowds, and, and he started to feel a little bit sorry for himself. And he said, that, uh, you spent your life for 50 years serving the Lord, and there's nobody there to greet you. You've wasted your life. He started to really feel bad for himself, and then all of a sudden, in this voice that just spoke to his heart, just as if he whispered into his ear, he says, but wait a minute, son. You're not home yet. You see, guys, you won't be in heaven for 30 seconds. And you're going to look back over your life and go, why didn't I worry less? Why didn't I trust God more? Why didn't I give more? Why didn't I, why didn't I serve more? Why didn't I pour more into this? I let worry, I let fear, I let all this, this stuff take away from what I could have experienced on earth and I didn't even realize it. You won't be in heaven 30 seconds if you're a believer and you'll say, why on earth did I get so discouraged? Why on earth did I let this control my life? Why was I so depressed all the time? You will understand that verse. God is, is able to do super abundantly. Super abundantly over and above what we dare ask or think. Infinitely beyond our highest prayer, our highest desire, our highest thoughts, our highest dreams. It's a blank check. You know, I, when I was sitting in that Jeep, sitting out there watching Caleb practice basketball, and God said to me, you're going to build a building. I thought to myself, this is crazy. I am not doing this. I am not going to do this, God. I do not want to be embarrassed. I don't want to be another one of those churches that has a sign on the property coming soon. I just didn't want to do it. And God said to me, He showed me, He said, Listen, whether you did the, this built in your life God, or not, you better take the shot and you better do what I tell you to do because you're going to. It's not the tragedy of what we suffer, guys, it's what we miss. It's so often you, your fear, that it's not what you suffer because of your fear, it's what you're missing. Some of you are sitting in your chairs right now and you ought to be in Haiti in two weeks and you're not going because of your fear. And that, sad, that to me is a sad, sad place to be in your life. I feel so sorry for somebody who is supposed to be doing something great for God and is not doing it because they're locked down and fearful and they're scared of what's going to happen. I came here in this church to play this church. We pulled up here with the U-Haul with $75 in our pocket. But I'll tell you what, in 12 years of serving God and seeing what He's done here, I don't regret one minute of it. Now, if I tried to all the way through it, lots of times. But guess what? I don't regret one minute of it because I know that God has done what He wanted to do and we have experienced it. But I guarantee you this, if we would have stayed home, we would have regretted it. We would have regretted it because we would have had this in the back of our mind. What if? What if we would have only attempted it? We would only have tried it. Here we go back to that question. What do you expect God to do in the next seven days of your life. Nothing, then probably nothing will happen. If you expect God to do something big in your life, then it will happen. If you expect God to do nothing in your life, it will, it will probably happen. When you study the ministry of Jesus Christ, that you always find that He did more than it was expected to do. Heal me. All right, you're healed and your sins are forgiven.
disciples came to Jesus and said, send them away. They're need to go eat. And he said, now I'll feed them. Jesus always did more than was expected. Here's your two approaches to life again, guys. You can either live by faith or you can live by fear. It's up to you. Let's go. Here we go. This is the adventure you were born.